In this video, we're going to talk about a very interesting and misunderstood topic, enlightenment. What is it? Is it attainable? If so, how does one reach it? Uh, what is it like to be enlightened, etc., etc.? To answer these questions, we're going to go over the most well-known and generally accepted version of enlightenment and briefly cover two very important branches of philosophy along the way. Now, the word enlightenment is thrown around lightly and it's generally a very elusive and misunderstood term. Many proponents of New Age spirituality will say enlightenment is elusive because our unenlightened perspective cannot grasp it, or some will say uh, enlightenment can only be experienced and not discussed. As we're going to show in this video, the reason it's so elusive is because virtually no one has any idea what it really means. By employing simple logic, we're going to show you how everything you've been told about enlightenment is dead wrong. For now, though, let's just use this definition as a proxy. Enlightenment is correctly understanding the nature of reality as it truly is. Now, when people hear the term enlightenment, a certain experience or feeling comes to mind. They'll picture gongs, uh, chanting, lotus position meditation, incense, or a guru speaking in perplexing ways. They'll think of abolishing the self. Uh, by recognizing the emptiness and nothingness that is reality. Uh, this conception is very popular among strands of Eastern religion and certain New Age groups. Now, these religions have many profound insights and are, in many ways, intuitively correct about the true nature of existence, but wrong about the correct way to approach understanding it. The West was correct about how to approach understanding ultimate reality, but wrong about what it, what it was approaching. Certain followers of Eastern religion will sometimes say the Western approach to knowledge is too analytical and that the true nature of reality cannot be rationalized, only intuited and felt. On the opposite side, the Western mind, with its tendency for analytical precision, will outright dismiss Eastern intuitions as being outside the scope of analysis, therefore false. Hyperionism synthesizes the two by taking the best of both approaches while abandoning their deficiencies. In a sense, it's the marriage of Western analytical precision with Eastern intuitive brilliance. Hyperionism offers a rigorous mathematical framework to explain and clarify Eastern insights, while at the same time bringing the spiritual dimension back into the sometimes cold and unimaginative Western scientific spirit. To give you an example of what we're talking about, let's discuss three aspects of Buddhist belief. The first is the Buddhist belief in the illusion of the self. Buddhists will say that as you attempt to analyze the self and come to any certain knowledge about it, you are led to the inexorable conclusion that there is not a solid or consistent self. To them, the self is simply an aggregate of sense perception and physical matter. It's uh, sort of similar to peeling back the layers of an onion. As you unpeel the layers of the self, you eventually really see there isn't anything there or there really isn't a core to it. Let's analyze this a bit further. They claim that enlightenment involves recognizing the illusion of self. Their claim is that an illusion of a self makes a choice to extinguish the illusion of itself. The immediate question arises as to how an illusory self can make a choice to abolish its own illusion. That's a classic category error. An illusion is, by definition, a deceptive appearance concealing something more true. So how can an illusion abolish an illusion? You're immediately thrown down a rabbit hole of infinite regress. By this logic, what's to say that the abolishing of the illusion of the self doesn't lead to yet another illusion? And doesn't this apply that nirvana itself is just another illusion as well? The only thing that can abolish an illusion is something that does not take part in illusion. Also, if there's no such thing as a soul or self, then a person is just a haphazard result of physical and karmic forces outside of one's control. So how can a haphazard result of cause and effect escape causation entirely? Only an autonomous self with free will outside the chain of cause and effect escape causation. Now, it's completely true that there are parts of ourselves that aren't static and can be considered illusory, but this does not mean, however, that there isn't an eternal mathematical soul that is not subject to change. As the German mathematician and philosopher Leibniz famously said, 
Nothing is in the intellect that was not first in the senses, except the intellect itself. Now, what this means is that the intellect itself is universal, eternal, and not subject to change. But that doesn't mean there aren't aggregates of sense perception or, let's say, societal conditioning that make up one's sense of self. Just as Buddhists claim any sense of self is an illusion, so they also say reality is, in itself, also an empty illusion. Why is the ultimate nature of reality emptiness? What is the sufficient reason for its existence or non-existence? Where is it located? Why does this cosmic emptiness spin endless illusions and confound us? Is it just a cosmic trickster? If reality is ultimately nothingness, why is it so suspiciously something? Now, the intuition that reality is ultimately composed of nothing is correct, but it doesn't properly explain why. This can all, in fact, be explained mathematically, as Morg discussed at length in his video titled, How is Existence Possible? As you can see, these belief systems outright refuse to engage with metaphysical questioning and logical consistency, therefore are ultimately full of bizarre speculations. Buddhists will say enlightenment is something that can only be experienced and cannot be explained analytically. To them, the truth of existence is something that can only be experienced subjectively, and because of this, one is literally forced to take them at their word. What's funny is Buddhists say you should never take the teachings of the Buddha on faith, but the end point of the entire Buddhist enterprise can, by definition, only be taken on faith, since it is something you can only experience. You therefore have to become a Buddhist and follow the path to know what the Buddha was talking about. Enlightenment most certainly has a subjective experiential aspect. However, this experience is predicated on a foundation of rationally deduced knowledge. Let's say for the sake of argument, Buddhist enlightenment is possible. When it's reached, how do you even go on living as a person if your sense of self is abolished? It would be impossible to interact with anyone. You'd be an extreme autistic without the ability to articulate thoughts and tell the difference between yourself and others. Only a person with a defined sense of self can live and function in a society with other selves. The Buddha himself went on teaching for another 40 or so years after his so-called enlightenment. So by Buddhist logic, the Buddha himself wasn't even enlightened. Try asking a Buddhist how they know the Buddha was actually enlightened, and you can be sure they will never give you sufficient reason since there isn't one. Their response will always be a fallacious appeal to authority. If only seekers of truth and spiritual knowledge knew there's been an underground enlightenment tradition that's been suppressed and nearly wiped out by the religious and political establishment. This tradition approaches enlightenment from a completely different perspective, based on a sage you've never guessed was one, and that you've probably heard of for the first time in primary school. This version of enlightenment stems from the great mathematician and philosopher Pythagoras, and was expanded upon by Plato and the subsequent Platonic tradition of philosophy and mathematics. This approach does not involve gurus or priests, prayer or meditation, and certainly not faith. It emphasizes reason over anything else. So let's uncover this fascinating well-kept secret and go over the wisdom of these ancient philosophers. Before you can even begin to work towards enlightenment, you have to first figure out what it is and how to get there. How can you begin to work towards something if you don't define with utmost precision what it is you're working towards and the proper methods to work towards it? It's extremely important to correctly answer these initial questions, otherwise the entire enterprise will be in vain. This cannot be stressed enough. Enlightenment is first and foremost answering all of the most important questions first, then working out the implications. The experience of enlightenment comes after the acquisition of infallible and indisputable knowledge. So to figure this all out, we must ask two extremely important questions that go hand in hand. One, what is the fundamental nature of reality? And two, are we as humans capable of understanding the fundamental nature of reality? These two questions are the starting point for two very important branches of philosophy, ontology and epistemology. Ontology is the branch of philosophy that deals with the nature of being, 
or existence as it is in itself. And epistemology is the study of the nature of knowledge, or what limits, if any, does the human mind have in acquiring any certain knowledge? In Hyperionism, we claim the ontological bedrock of existence is numbers. Now, we do not mean mathematical notation as floating around somewhere in space, that's just elementary picture thinking. Rather, numbers equal waves, and sine and cosine waves combine to create everything in existence. Um, for those who have just stumbled upon Hyperionism, I'd recommend checking out Morg's video series for more information on the ontological status of mathematics. In Hyperion epistemology, a sufficiently rational mind can attain to ultimate knowledge of the nature of reality. Yes, we claim you can know everything. Now, it's important to understand what we mean by everything. We do not mean you can know all of the contingent details or facts about physical reality, as it is literally impossible, and you'd be led down a path of infinite regress without arriving at any certain knowledge. As Hyperians, we know that knowledge is not had through the flawed senses, since they only give a phantom of the real mathematical forms underlying existence. We hold that every single mind or soul comes innately loaded with all the secrets of the universe, since each soul contains a complete set of the entirety of mathematics. The trouble is, we're all mired in the physical domain of matter. This overwhelming physical experience of sounds, tastes, smells, and biological drives causes us to forget our true nature. As we examine ourselves and acquire knowledge, we are literally remembering or uncovering our own innate knowledge of objective reality. We are all in a sense like Hercules, part mortal and part immortal. It is the immortal part of ourselves where true knowledge lies. In the Hyperion system, there's a special type of knowledge that leads to true enlightenment. This knowledge is had through exercising our reason and arriving at eternal and necessary truths. These eternal and necessary truths are those of mathematics. Now, why does enlightenment hinge on understanding mathematics? Well, if you remember from earlier, our definition of enlightenment was understanding reality as it truly is. So if number is what reality is made of, then learning the code or language that reality is based upon will ultimately lead us to an enlightened state of understanding and being. What's a better way to quote unquote merge with nature than to understand the language it speaks? Now, the task is not just to understand mathematics, but to internalize it. Picture for a moment a professional musician. Before a musician can play an instrument, he or she must learn how to read musical notation. Once the notation is learned, they must practice playing those notes in increasingly greater and greater combinations. Over time, the musician will begin to play the instrument without having to think about it. They have, in effect, internalized the notation and can begin to play without thinking. Now, when we say they no longer have to think about it, what we really mean is they are thinking intuitively rather than discursively. A mind, by definition, can do nothing but think. The difference lies in how it thinks. The same goes with understanding mathematics. At first, the notation is alien and foreign. It looks like random jots on paper with no real meaning. Then you begin to study the syntax of mathematical notation. You learn the rules and can begin to manipulate the notation. Just like learning to play an instrument, you learn to internalize it until you can literally think it without thinking it. Remember, mathematics is reality, so if you internalize the language of existence, it will, in a sense, speak to you and you can speak to it. What is the climax of it all? The actual manipulation of reality to one's own will. But perhaps that's a topic for another time. There's no better way to demonstrate this topic than through Plato's analogy of the divided line. Some of you who have taken a philosophy course may already be familiar with this, but we're going to examine it as Plato really meant it, and not in the watered-down, misunderstood way the stale lecture halls of the current academy will explain it to you. In this picture, we see the divided line. The first two sections on the line deal with the visible world of appearances and the face value acceptance of personal and public opinion. The last two sections 
to deal with what Plato called the intelligible realm, or the world beyond the realm of appearance. This realm deals with rational unobservables, or what lies beyond the senses. The first section on the divided line, Icasia, which roughly translates to imagining, is the most unenlightened state of mind. A mind at this level accepts appearances at face value and is wholly trapped in the cave of ignorance, fixated on the shadows playing upon the walls of the cave, forever ignorant of the world outside. The next stage above Icasia is Pistis, which roughly means faith. This state of mind believes in whatever nonsense someone tells them is true without discovering for oneself what sufficient reason there is to believe in it. This is the level that followers of Abrahamic religions as well as Eastern religions such as Buddhism and Taoism operate on. The third section of the line is Dianoia, which means to think or reason. This is the first level one operates on when contemplating the intelligible realm. It is, in effect, the bridge between the realm of opinion to the realm of knowledge. This level of knowledge is embodied in the study of mathematics. The ancient Pythagoreans and Platonists studied mathematics as a means to purify the intellect from the dross of immediate sense perception and the face value acceptance of something based on faith alone. The final section on this divided line is noesis, which is called rational intuition. This is the stage of internalizing the mathematical forms of existence so that one leaves behind discursive reasoning and enters an immediate intuitive apprehension of these mathematical forms. This is the highest stage that a Pythagorean or Platonic sage reaches in his or her ascent to what is called the good or the one. When Hyperians talk about enlightenment, we are always talking about rising through the levels of knowing demonstrated on the divided line until we reach the end state of noesis. Reaching noesis is the exact opposite of Buddhist enlightenment. A person who has attained noesis has done the exact opposite of abolishing the self. They have self-actualized themselves. They are fully developed souls, all-knowing and all-wise, who have gone beyond human. As you can see, enlightenment is had through the acquisition of knowledge. And knowledge, as we all know, is had through study. Knowledge literally transforms you. The issue most people have with this answer is that it requires, wait for it, hard work. It involves exercising the mind and becoming a mental Olympian. Hyperians are life affirmers, not life deniers. We want to cultivate the mind and experience reality in all of its glory. And this includes triumphs and yes, suffering too. It is only by suffering through hardships that the greatest joy and fulfillment arises. We don't want to disengage from society and become cloistered in a monastery somewhere. We want to do good in this world and change society for the better. Part of being free and enlightened is trying our hardest to free and enlighten others through the creation of a new society that allows every single soul to have the potential to actualize itself. Ask yourself this question. What sounds more enlightened to you? Can you see the truth? If you want to disengage from the world and annihilate your illusory self, go right ahead. But you'll be wasting your life blinded to the truth and utter beauty of reality itself. You'll be fighting against the inevitable, upwards, evolutionary trajectory of existence. Don't turn a blind eye towards reality. Rather, embrace it. Learn its language and actualize yourself as the eternal and indestructible soul that you are. You have existed for eternity. Nothing can destroy you, no matter how hard you try. The only thing we need to detach ourselves from and abolish in this life is bad and unproductive ideas. Enlightenment is about replacing false and unproductive ideas with better ones, ones that make you better and give you greater power over yourself. Remember, you have the potential to become a god or goddess if you but remember who and what you are. As Plato once said, all knowledge is but remembrance. So get out there, learn, and remember who you are.